Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the fifth installment of Until Further Notice, a series of conversations about the current conditions and future of the uh, art professions. Um, in the past weeks, we've been talking to gallerists, to artists, and today we switch to uh, if I may use this broad and reductive category, museum curators. Um, it is my privilege to uh, introduce today's panelist. Uh, we have uh, joining us from California, Marina Pugliese, uh, former director of Museo del Novecento in Milan and currently at, uh, teaching at the uh, California College of Art. And uh, Laura Mattioli joining us from New York. Uh, she is the uh, uh, founder and president of the Center for Italian Modern Art here in New York. Uh, my name is Paolo Barlera. I'm the interim director of the Italian Cultural Institute. To moderate the conversation, as usual, we have with us Maurita Cardone, uh, who is also the uh, creator and uh, coordinator of the entire series. Thank you, Maurita, thank you, Marina, and thank you, Laura, for uh, joining us today. And uh, I leave the screen and microphones to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo, and thank you to the Italian Cultural Institute for hosting uh, until further notice, uh, and to our audience for being here once again. Um, as usual, I will introduce our guests and then we will start chatting and at the end of our conversation there will be time for a few questions from, from the ad audience, um, which you will be able to ask using the uh, Q&A button in the Zoom toolbar. Uh, since 1983, Laura Mattioli has been the curator responsible for a vast uh, collection of Italian avant-garde and modern art inherited from her father Gianni Mattioli. Considered one of the most important aggregations of Italian avant-garde and modern art, the collection has, under her, this stewardship, loaned works to institutions throughout the world, including the Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice. As an art historian, scholar, curator, and collector, Laura specializes in 20, 20th century Italian art and has published, lectured, presented extensively on the subject. In 2014, she founded the Center for Italian Modern Art in the Soho neighborhood of New York City with the mission of spreading awareness about and fostering research on Italian modern art. Marina Pugliese is an art historian and a museum specialist, internationally known as a scholar in the conservation of contemporary art. She led a, consor a consortium of diverse museums in Milan, having founded two of the three institutions, Museum del no Museo del Novecento and MUDEC. In 1997, she was awarded a scholarship by the Accademia dei Lincei in Rome, in 1999, she was awarded an international scholarship by the Université Paris 1 with the Università di Paris. In 2013, she was a scholar at the Getty Conservation Institute. Between 2017 and 2018, she co-curated with Barbara Ferriani and Vicente Todoli the exhibition Lucio Fontana, Ambienti, Environments, Hunger, Bicocca, Milan. Between 2018 and 2019, she was creative director of the Future Humans Video Archive at the Bergurgen Institute in Los Angeles, and she currently teaches at the California College of the Arts and is the head of public art for the city of Milan. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Marina, for being here. Um, how are you? Thank you for having us. Thanks, Marita. Um, so we usually start this conversation from the beginning of uh, this uh, time of changes we are experiencing right now. So um, uh, from March, <laughs> when the pandemic started. 
Um, so where my question to you, my first question to you is what, where were you when they started? What were you working on? And uh, was your life and your work uh, practice uh, affected by um, the pandemic? Uh, Laura, you want to start? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have to close uh, uh, Centro for Italia Modern Art, CIMA, in March 13, as all the museums in New York. We are in the middle of our season with fellow and a lot of public and exhibition uh, that was about Marino Marini. And uh, after that, the fellow left because they prefer to come back to Italy. They are afraid for the families and what is going on. And we are still closed. I wish uh, we can open the center again with the exhibition that will be about Mario Schifano in the end of January uh, 2021. Uh, we continue to be active uh, with our members uh, with, uh, um, of course, uh, in uh, communication online and film and uh, other media and also now with a vis guided visit uh, to what is opening uh, in the town. Uh, but uh, the change uh, was radical because uh, of course uh, we lose a lot of the contact with the public. I'm thinking maybe, Laura, for those uh, at home who don't know Chima very well, um, maybe you want to explain a little bit about the fellowships and what you do with yes, uh, what Chima is first at all a center for research, but now is able also to publish an important magazine with all the research published that were done uh, through our uh, promoted by Chima. Uh, we have a fourth fellow at the moment every year, two are in the spring and two in the fall. And uh, we have a study days and uh, the subject of the study is every year related to the exhibition that we are having. We have uh, normally one exhibition at the moment that uh, runs nine months from October to June. And uh, uh, this is the, uh, the point of uh, communication between the fellow and the large public because also the fellow are very much involved, uh, not only living and studying between that, that works, that it is rare, uh, also uh, to uh, discuss and explain and uh, have a, um, different kind of meetings uh, with the public uh, coming to visit the exhibition. Um, this is uh, probably will change in the future. Probably the nine months uh, exhibition will be two exhibition, one short and one longer. We are looking in what way to follow what is going on uh, in the world. Thank you. Marina, what was your experience? I really it badly that uh, Chima is a public uh, a charity and uh, it's not uh, my toy, my personal toy in some way. Uh, I worked a lot for uh, the starting of this institution, but it's very important that this institution continue to live also without me by, by in the future, because uh, I am old and I wish to look a future for China. Sorry. And by the way, it's a beautiful place. So as soon as you open back, please go visit Chimo because it's really, really a beautiful place. Uh, Marina, what was your experience? So during when COVID hit, uh, I was in the Bay Area where I live uh, and I was teaching at the California College of the Arts and I was preparing uh, an online symposium, I mean, no, a symposium um, for the Asian Art Museum uh, with uh, uh, Tarek Laik, uh, who is a visual anthropologist. Uh, I was invited by Abby Chen, um, who is the chief of uh, contemporary art at the Asian Art Museum. And so we were preparing this uh, uh, symposium and uh, in, it immediately, um, uh, we, we understood immediately that the world was going to change, you know, dramatically. And so we had to change our, uh, you know, idea and program for the symposium to turn it into a, an, a, an online symposium. And, and, then, and then we decided also to focus on how cultural institution would have transitioned, you know, uh, on the digital because of, of, uh, COVID. Uh, which uh, opens up to my next question, uh, which is uh, um, exactly about that. So uh, many cultural institutions uh, having uh, to adapt to this new reality uh, switched uh, to online, uh, online uh, viewing rooms or uh, online programming. Uh, how do you see that change and do you think it's 
it's something that was uh, in a way needed, uh, something that was necessary uh, anyways. Um, or maybe, uh, or maybe it's something that you see like temporary. Uh, and what, what was your your specific ex experience with that? Because uh, you, Marina, mentioned uh, having an experience with uh, online uh, programming. Yeah. Laura didn't mention it, but Chima also did something uh, online, and it, uh, that there is a nice video on their website uh, about the Marino Marini uh, show. Um, so maybe this time you want to start, Marina. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I didn't, I didn't add something which was, you know, about my delusion because also some, some projects which were, you know, meant to be have been cancelled because of COVID. So uh, it was br spring break and I was meant to go to teach in a, and study in Argentina at the Espigas Foundation. And then in May, I should have gone in Tokyo to the Ritsumaikan University and all of this was cancelled, including, you know, all the research I was meant to, uh, to run in that period. And... Uh, uh, so getting back uh, um, on uh, how cultural institutions uh, have transitioned to the digital, I, I would say that the first reaction was the one to cover void. So somehow, you know, to make up all, all the, all the, all the um, activities that they had to cancel, all the, you know, the physical, uh, real world uh, of cultural institution and so they they uploaded a lot of uh, you know content which probably was even too much because we were like overwhelmed uh, by this uh, uh, cultural offer which often was it wasn't even, you know, like um, digested enough intellectually. I mean, it was just a cover up of a, of a, of a void. Um, while on the other hand, I think uh, it was very, and it has been really interesting to think about how, you know, to take advantage of this uh, uh, transition, which obviously it's a big, you know, leap into the void because it implies, uh, um, it implies a lot of, uh, you know, it implies to explore new territories, uh, to learn how to use uh, new platforms, uh, uh, to think digitally, which is a totally different approach to reality than to think analogically. So on the one hand, I would say uh, the first approach was quite basic, not from everyone, but I mean, you know, generally speaking. Um, but on the other hand, it is it is super interesting, you know, the fact that uh, now we, we can have a digital offer which has changed our, um, our approach to many things for instance the symposiums you know like uh, uh, once uh, another thing that I had cancelled uh, for the COVID was I was meant to go to Hong Kong and I would have traveled 15 hours on a plane to talk for one hour okay so imagine also the environmental impact of my talk so nowadays nobody would ever consider any longer such a thing right because now it's it's normal for everyone that we organize symposium with people from all over the world you know and uh, and it's online and i think this is one of the many things which will never go back again to you know uh, to the to the to the previous reality um, so I, I do think the digital, you know, gives us a lot of uh, uh, fantastic possibilities. It will never replace the physical for some circumstances. We will maybe, you know, talk about this later on in this conversation. Have you seen anything you liked in terms of uh, how museums presented their collections, virtual viewing rooms or, uh, I don't know, yeah. anything the that you would like to point out? The Victoria and Albert Museum, I mean, the, the, the Brits are always pretty good at doing things. And I have to say, like, the, the Victoria and Albert Museums did um, a fun activity, which was about, like, exploring their collections uh, in, a, in, a, in a, it was like in a cartoonish way, so that you could pick up and choose some elements, for instance, a wig uh, of the 18th century, and, and you could, you know, design spaces around. That was, that was fun and entertaining at the same time. Laura, what are your thoughts on um, the online version of cultural experiences? Uh, of course, uh, the culture is going a, a lot to be used online, uh, but uh, much of our past is not possible to translate in uh, online. Uh, one of the things that Chima tried to communicate is that the experience of the works in real is not, uh, is not uh, possible to replace with uh, in a reproduction. 
And uh, I wish we can come back to this point. At last, for the works they are made uh, in a physical elements uh, are not uh, born to be uh, on the web. That could be, of course, the future. Um, for this reason, uh, uh, for me, uh, we did the, the short uh, uh, record of the Wuxi exhibition of Marino that we have to close uh, very soon, uh, but this is not the equivalent of the experience of the exhibition. And uh, I wish we can come back uh, also to the real uh, experience of the things. And uh, uh, this is uh, for me very, very important. One of the pivotal things we can try to do also for the scholars. They don't study only on the computer, only on the books, only on the image, uh, the reproduction, but uh, in the, on the real object. Uh, you said something interesting. Uh, it wasn't born to be online. So I'm wondering if there might be a way to, you know, once we know that some things might uh, be done specifically for the online, if there are ways to... Yes, I think this is will be the future of the communication. We have also to reframe our idea of art, the art, the traditional art lost a lot of the use she has in the past. Uh, for example, uh, now the, the president of the states uh, don't have a, a sculpture representing them in the middle of the place, uh, but uh, go on, on uh, the television uh, or in Inter or the Twitter. <laughs> and this is uh, meaning something. Huh? Yeah, that's very interesting what you just said. Um, and so you both seem to um, to think that this is never gonna uh, be a substitution for um, for the real, for the uh, physical experience, for the experience that audiences can have when they are in presence of uh, artworks. But I'm wondering if any ways there might be something that changes the relationship between people, between, between uh, you know, the audience and the artworks in um, giving them the opportunity to experience them also on other, on different types of channels. Is, uh, do, do you see that as an enrichment or uh, whoever wants to <laughs> start? So for sure it is an enrichment and if we think about the past when we didn't have websites i mean the first you know approach towards the cultural institution was the physical one while nowadays before going to visit uh, any place you know you first check on the internet and you check the website and you know so this is like the first approach is always digital nowadays said this i totally agree with laura like uh, the artwork has a has a physical and uh, analogical appearance, 3D appearance that th this can never be, you know, it, it can never be compensated enough by any uh, digital offer. Also, you know, the experience of visiting a museum is a is a physical experience. So you are engaged as as much intellectually as you are engaged with your body moving around the space. That's why the display, for instance, it is so crucial. You know. In, in museums and in the way uh, the narrative uh, is, uh, is built. Uh, said this, I also believe that in this very context, uh, which is, you know, the COVID and the fact that, you know, um, visiting closed spaces might be dangerous, even though, you know, the visit, I mean, people in museums basically shut up uh, and, and contemplate artworks. So I would say museums are much safer places than, you know, uh, other kind of places. But I also believe that museums should get into, you know, quoting Rosalind Krauss, what is an expanded field. I mean, uh, they should thin their walls and they should project themselves outside as much as they can. Um, and, you know, work uh, in the surroundings, work in the city, be, you know, be there where the people are. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm thinking that at the same time, there might be something that, um, you know, through uh, virtual reality, the uh, artificial intelligence, maybe there, there are other information that, that there is other information that can be put in inside within the experience of uh, looking at an artwork that maybe not be visible uh, just by seeing the object itself. I don't know, it could be, you know, uh, augmented reality or 
uh, other uh, technologies. I guess we will see <laughs> what happens. Yeah, for sure. Um, and um, um, yeah, that, that could also be in a way, um, cultural institutions could also embrace that uh, and, uh, and start having a more uh, educational role maybe. What do you think? Um, you know, and, and hands. Yes. I, I remember ages ago when, when the Tate appointed an e-learning specialist. Mm. Yeah, and, and this kind of, you know, shocked me about the difference between, between you know, the staff in Italian museums uh, and, and, and British museums. Uh, I mean, obviously the Tate is a huge institution, but, you know, to have somebody who is specialized in, you know, online uh, learning, this, you know, speaks volume. Um, about about the importance, obviously, of, of this sector, and and about how uh, these are things that cannot be improvised. Mm. Uh, they imply, you know, a deep knowledge, and they imply nowadays. I would say also a lot of creativity because everybody is going digital, everybody is going online. So you will make the difference just if you are, you know, creative enough to offer something. Which is which is you know different and also which makes uh, uh, which gives you know the right information in the right way and and it's engaging above all it's engaging. So yeah, probably I mean this will be an occasion, an opportunity, uh, or hopefully it will, uh, for institutions to look into it more and see what are the uh, options that are available. Uh, Laura, do you think Chima will continue? Uh, doing that kind of job trying to find new ways to engage of course uh, uh, has ch changed and uh, chima has a very good result uh, on this uh, side for example uh, just uh, shortly ago four months ago uh, we have a new director and she asked me if she can change our website in the way if the website could fit with the requirement by the brazil and because it was a little expensive, I asked her, but how many audience we have in Brazil? <laughs> because, uh, and she told me, oh, we have uh, some best 50 people. And I was surprised because uh, I, I, I really, I didn't realize. Uh, we have really a, a very, we have a very good person that uh, manage all this uh, young, of course, more, more, uh, one of the most younger that we have. And uh, is when we have a huge audience uh, through the Facebook, Instagram and uh, this kind of uh, communication. This is very important. The other side, I think, uh, is important uh, to have uh, 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 to be um, more conscious of the difference between the real artwork and the reproduction and uh, the copies. Uh, I was shocked, for example, to know um, a while ago that in Japan uh, there are people they are reproducing, I don't know, the Sistine Chapel in the same real side uh, on a very hard material as a very hard kind of ceramics in the way it could survive for the future in case of Rome as a bomb, I don't know what. Uh, this means uh, that in that culture, there is not an idea of the difference between the original and the material of the original and the, the copy and the reproduction. Also in the past, perhaps, uh, was a difference that don't exist. Uh, from the Roman people, they reproduced so many Greek uh, masterpieces, uh, also in other material, from the bronze to the marble, for example. It was not a problem. But uh, in general, I think we have a to be conscious of uh, this situation. They are the real object, they are the reproduction, they are the reinterpretation. And uh, this is uh, something that affects our uh, everyday life as the, the fake news or the news <laughs> affect our, our everyday life. Very much so. <laughs> um, these times are uh, times of changes, not only because of the pandemic, but also because, uh, and in a way it is connected to the pandemic, but not only, uh, but also because uh, our societies are going through some turmoil, some social uh, upheaval. Um, so do you think that cultural institutions should um, 
reflect what's happening in society and how would they be able, could they um, live up to their mission uh, in these specific times, in these times of changes? Um, whoever wants to start. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I, I do believe that cultural institutions uh, have to reflect uh, how times are changing. It is part of their mission, uh, but they also have to do it in, in, in respect and considering the collections and the history, the specific history of, of different institutions. So what I want to say is one size does not fit all. Um, for instance, you know, the history of Italian museums is very much different than the one of uh, uh, American museums. Uh, and uh, I mean, getting, getting back to a, to a debate, uh, I mean, this debate about, especially, especially considering, you know, 20th century art museums, uh, the debate about, you know, changing narratives began many years ago. And at the beginning, it was about, you know, changing from a chronological narrative to a, um, to a diachronical one. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, again, it was started by the mom in New York and by Tate and Centre Pompidou, where they began, you know, um, they began uh, changing the display, going through big thematic uh, focuses, if you remember that, okay? So instead of telling, you know, the whole uh, uh, narrative in a, in a chronological sequence, they were talking about the body, for instance, you know, or um, the still life, okay? And, um, and, and some Italian museums tried to mimic this, and it was kind of ridiculous, because, um, I mean, you can play a game depending on, you know, the 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 elements you have and so and so for instance a museum like novecento which basically tells the history of italian art of the 20th century uh has has a different take on things you know so you cannot you know uh change dramatically the narrative i mean you have to consider the elements you have said this uh, change is needed, and the change is what, uh, you know, changes is, you know, how do you look at future? So, for instance, when you talk about acquisitions, definitely uh, you should consider to diversify, you should consider to include, uh, but this always, you know, also respecting the identity of the specific institution you're in. Right. Laura, what are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are that... Uh, um, um, what we, we always uh, uh, told here, uh, also mixing uh, um, more older works uh, with more contemporary works, so one or two just as reference, that we look at the past always from where we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, the eye of today, uh, we cannot uh, change our eye of today. And uh, uh, what was telling my teacher many years ago, is that if you don't look to the contemporary, also our look to the past is lost. And uh, I wish that always uh, this discussion can make more alive the problems we are looking to. Right. Um, yeah, I guess this is um, also connected. And, and again, uh, Marina is absolutely right about the fact that we cannot um, uh, talk about uh, museums everywhere, like uh, museums in, in Italy and museums in, in the States are completely different realities. Um, but at the same time, th there is also this thing that is happening throughout the world, not only in the States, though, especially in the States, that is um, the public is asking to museums and culture and cultural institutions in general to uh, to be more representative of the uh, complexity of society and uh, especially uh, of diversities. Um, so I'm wondering how do you uh, how do you feel specifically about that uh, issue? Uh, should they? Should they try to do that? Should they um, sh should it be mandated in a way, or um, or how how do you do that? Do you do it by appointing curators that are specifically uh, intended to do that job, or should it happen more naturally by connecting to the communities? Uh, what's yeah. um 
Yeah, again, I do believe there's a big difference between the situation in the US uh, and uh, and in Italy. There, I mean, you cannot compare them. Um, but in the US, I think there's a systemic huge uh, problems which gets uh, to the foundation of this uh, um, of this nation, which is the fact that uh, uh, education is not fair, public education is not fair. And so as long as uh, they will not change the system and they will not give the same access to, 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 to culture and, uh, and to a good, a good education to, to everybody, we will not have uh, the same level of diversity, you know, in, in uh, uh, PhD students uh, and, uh, you know, high level education. So this is on the one hand. Uh, while this is different in Italy because education is for free and everybody has access and so it depends you know on the singular people um, on the on the other hand um, I strongly believe we have to diversify the public uh, the collections uh, and, and also the projects uh, again as I said before given and respecting the identity of uh, different institutions but to give you to give you an example when I was uh, uh, director of Novecenti Milan uh, Piazza Duomo Milan is a place where during the weekend uh, all the migrants community um, uh, get together uh, because the Milanese, most of the Milanese uh, uh, leave the city for the weekend, okay? And, but nobody, nobody was, was coming to visit the museum, even though the museum was for free from 5 uh, p.m. on. Uh, and so we decided, this was during the summer, so we decided to do um, an activity involving uh, um, some uh, um, educate, like an educational program of people who talk different languages, including uh, uh, French, English, Chinese, Arabic. And, uh, and so we had all these people who were um, giving leaflets in different languages and inviting uh, all the international communities present there uh, telling them the museum is for everybody, the museum is owned by everybody, so please come, you're the welcome to visit the museum. And it was amazing to see how, you know, it was like a spread of, uh, of, of words, and, and, and then in the weekends, we, we really, you know, were seeing the museum visited by um, these international communities, which before were never, would have never probably even thought, you know, of, of coming and, and, and visiting the museum. On the other hand, now as head of public art for the city of Milan, um, obviously, I mean, when you talk about public art, you, you also talk about, you know, different and problematic neighborhoods. So we, we do have in mind, you know, projects which will be um, community uh, focused and involving different communities uh, as, you know, the protagonists of our activities. Uh, it's interesting where you, this, the story you just told us, because uh, it feels like in that case, uh, the, the story about the migrants coming in, uh, in that case, it was really about just opening the doors. Yes. And sometimes yes. And, it's, and, it's, and, it's and, that simple. <laughs> Yeah, and communicating that, you know, who, whoever, everybody is welcome, which right. is a message which we give for granted, but it is not that granted, you know, for, for new, uh, new, new migrants who, you know, have just arrived. And uh, so that was, that was absolutely crucial. Well, I guess even for Italians, you know, in that case, it's not a, a matter of ethnic group, it's a matter maybe of class education, but also for some Italians, you know, it might be, museums might be perceived as uh, elite spaces where, you know, you're not, I don't know, you don't feel comfortable going or you feel like you're, you're excluded from that kind of culture. Yeah. So. No, no, this is true, but at least there's, there's not a language barrier. Right, right, and and Absolutely. with with uh, um, with let's say uh, people who would generally not visit the museum, children are you know the the right contact. Like all the activities you do towards children, at the end will bring up you know also the families. This is the experience we had. Laura, what do you think about what you're seeing both here or in Italy? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to tell that. Uh, museum as a kind of institution uh, are European. And uh, the other culture, as for example, the Muslim culture or the Chinese culture or the Indian culture, don't know the idea of museum. Mm. And for this reason, you can find on the Sunday a lot of uh, Muslim or Indian people in the zoo and nobody in the museum. 
And in the museum, you find a lot of French and Italian because this is a different story. We created the museums and this makes the difference. And to, to, in inclusion in the museum means to share a culture. Otherwise, they are different cultures that is difficult to speak between. This was one thing. The other thing, I agree absolutely with Marina about the problem of the schools in the States. Uh, in uh, the, the importance uh, to build uh, more uh, high quality of the public school uh, to give access uh, to everybody to the best uh, possibilities in life. And for this reason, CIMA will work uh, soon, not now because the problems are too many, in, uh, currently without uh, the, the presence of the of the scholars in, in the schools, uh, the fellow in the schools, but uh, as is possible uh, to make uh, lessons for the teachers in the way they can use arts, uh, visual, visual communication in general as a way to teach and uh, to have a different approach. And this will be an important mission, I wish, for CIMA and, uh, and because of course we have to build uh, through also the American public institution is not something that we can build by ourselves only. But this is a, pri a priority in our programs. And um, well, uh, I would like also to tell uh, that uh, uh, I think the Italian art is important and we promote Italian art, not because only we are Italian and we are uh, patriotic, but also because it is a model that can teach a lot to other communities. It, because Italian artists, uh, when they start to make a modern art, an art that is for our times, they had always to deal with the culture be behind them. The, the, the importance of the old and the Renaissance and Baroque and uh, Roman art are so strong and so close physically also to the people, to the, uh, uh, to the artists, that they cannot uh, build it. They have an art without uh, um, deal with the problem of the culture and the past. And this, I think, is a universal problem because many cultures, all the culture perhaps in the world, that is globalized need today a contemporary language but need also to deal with the past of each different culture and to find a way to, to put the, uh, our, the past in pre also teaching something in the present. And uh, for this reason, I think the experience of the 20th century in art in Italy is really something that could be uh, very important as example, as, uh, as uh, experience for all the countries. I was actually going to ask when you were talking about uh, your um, upcoming uh, programs with the teachers, I was going to ask if you were going to have uh, a focus specifically on Italian art. Uh, and if you were, why? I, I guess in a way you already answered that because Italian art has that. Uh, are, are you going to have a focus on Italian art, by the way? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> uh, I think we, we can try to teach how the image can be a way uh, to teach literature, to teach history, to teach uh, many, also mathematics. Uh, because uh, uh, the language is different from the image. They are two different languages. This is terrible for me that when I have to write something about art because my world never are completely equivalent to the image. And the image is another language we can use to communicate uh, mostly with the young children in a very immediate way. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, it, it's very interesting what you were saying about uh, Italian art being uh, so uh, deeply connected with uh, its own past. So it might be interesting to have uh, to have that approach uh, with uh, with uh, Ita American you know, American audiences. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to be super productive. <laughs> Um, Maurita, can, can I can I resonate absolutely. a little bit uh, with uh, what Laura said before yes. about uh, museums? Uh, 
um, and uh, and also with the Japanese culture of conservation. So I would say yes, museums are um, European institutions, but uh, very much at the expenses of uh, other cultures. And uh, this is something we should always, uh, you know, take into consideration. And also, the fact that uh, Europeans uh, invented the idea of museum doesn't mean that other cultures didn't have uh, an approach towards conservation. And this gets back, uh, you know, from uh, to what Laura said at the beginning about the uh, Sistina Chapel uh, redesigned, uh, recreated somehow by um, someone in, in Japan. Well, the, um, the Japanese approach towards conservation is totally different to our one, is uh, uh, surely uh, a sophisticated and very complex one, which has, uh, you know, uh, which, you know, reverberates with a different, uh, you know, uh, intellectual and philosophical approach, you know, towards time. And and, uh, and and who knows, you know, considering considering their history, you know, and uh, what went through, you know, with Second World War, maybe uh, their approach towards, you know, a duplicate, uh, uh, whatever that is, I, I don't know specifically, you know, the project, but their, their idea of a duplicate uh, of the Sistina Chapel, you know, it, it's more, much, more, much more comprehensible considering their own history, you know, than, than, than our specific one. I guess it's uh, anyway worth uh, opening a dialogue with uh, other cultures on these sure. topics because there's definitely something to learn from that approach as well. Um, I wanted to discuss, and we're actually getting close to the end, so if the audience wants to, if anyone in the audience wants to ask questions, this would be the right time to start writing it down in the Q&A uh, chat. Um, uh, but I wanted to get to uh, one of the most pressing issues right now for cultural institutions because, you know, uh, in the States now museums are open, but they were closed for a while and uh, in Italy they are not open at all. So, of course, this uh, brings financial uh, issues to the table. Um, and, um, you know, it, it feels like it's going to be, um, there are going to be our, our times for uh, cultural institutions in general and museums specifically. Um, I'm wondering if, what you think about this and, um, you know, if you have any solution in mind and also if, um, if you, uh, if you've been affected directly by what's happening right now in your work. Uh, and also, again, if you have solutions, but also if you think that, you know, we will be able, museums will be able to uh, overcome these difficulties and go back to normal. Um, Laura? Chima, uh, Chima is struggling to survive, of course, as all the institution, losing uh, all the income normally we have uh, with the uh, events, uh, with the tickets for the show, and all these kind of things. Uh, but uh, uh, we ask, uh, just to, because it's very important to be a public charity, and to live with the majority of the funds coming from the large public, we really ask help, as all the institutions are asking. Uh, we, uh, pr we promote uh, a delay, uh, uh, the membership will be uh, over for all the time we are closed. For example, we are closed 10 months, the membership will be alive for 10 months more. But in any case, we ask our members, if they can, to help us, because uh, we never left at home nobody. And we continue to give also the grants uh, because uh, just the young people in this moment lost a lot of possibilities and uh, they really need to survive and to continue to work as a researcher in this moment. And uh, yes, of course, uh, I asked to help as all the institution asked to help. The situation in Europe is different because there's a part from the state that don't exist in, uh, in uh, states. In the United States, uh, all is made by the private uh, people. Yeah, and also I guess probably in Italy the uh, membership model is not, membership model is not that, um, that common, is it? Yeah. No, it's, it's important, absolutely, because many things, uh, for example, when, uh, when the museum wants to purchase something, the money comes mostly from the members, uh, from the supporters. Right. 
uh, in, in state is absolutely vital because uh, without that you, do, you don't exist without uh, the, the supporters, of course. Right. Um, also, uh, I don't know, there are possibilities uh, for, to access the university is more easy in, uh, uh, in uh, Italy in some way because the costs are less than to continue to study for a PhD or for a master in states where the costs are more very high. Of course. What we want, of course, that uh, not only Italians study Italian art, we want uh, Americans, we want people from all the world that study Italian arts because uh, it needs to be an international subject. Right. Um, Marina, what was your experience or what is your experience right now with uh, the struggles of uh, cultural institutions? Well, I do have the experience with my with my students. So for instance, I'm uh, teaching uh, a class which is about uh, for MFA students, which is about you know um, realizing and building a, an exhibition. And uh, but many of them are international, and they they have gone back to their countries. So basically, we are you know thinking about a virtual in exhibition, which is which is very difficult and. Uh, um, on the other hand, I have to say that in general term, this situation has been also, you know, a reality check for the art market, which was absolutely, you know, uh, there was too much of a contrast, you know, between the values uh, of the art market and the life of the people involved in the art environment were living, you know, like, so artists struggling, you know, to pay rent and then artworks with, you know, valuations of millions of, of dollars. So um, let's hope at least this will kind of, you know, um, change in general the art world, uh, you know, shaping it in a, in a more fair way, e even though generally things don't go this way, you know, if there's a chance they go worse, they don't go better. I'm sorry, I cannot be that positive. <laughs> we we want to be a little bit more optimistic. Come on. Um, I'm wondering, because you both have worked both in the States and in Italy. So I'm wondering if you, uh, on this topic you have, um, you know, in a, in a way, I think what we're experiencing right now is also uh, a, a confrontation between two different models, right? What, what's happening here and what's happening in Italy. Everybody's struggling, but what what's um, in a situation like this? Wh which model is more um, efficient or faces better the uh, struggle? <laughs> uh, the uh, public model or the endowment model? What, sorry, I don't think we can use the Trump model uh, with the, the the management of the pandemic as a model. Oh, no, no, no. I, I was talking specifically about cultural institutions. If, you know, the fact that... Uh, Trump closed the borders and closed the borders to all the fellow, all the teachers, uh, all the people that... Very nice as well. <laughs> and, and this is a terrible. I cannot come back to Italy because otherwise I cannot come back in States. And uh, this was uh, really uh, catastrophic. For, uh, for many universities that may have a lot of money from the student coming from abroad. Right. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a tragedy for universities. Um, I, I was more specifically talking about uh, the differences between, we have more, as you were saying, Laura, uh, we have in Italy, uh, the, the states, the governments, uh, or in Europe in general, uh, governments are behind uh, cultural institutions. They have that, um, uh, that model. In, in the States it's more uh, endowments uh, and uh, foundations. So I'm, I'm wondering if in a situation like this, which one of the two models is actually uh, more prepared to face the difficulties? Uh, Marina, perhaps. Yes, okay. Um, I would say they both have huge limits. And they both showed their limits in this circumstance. Uh, so in the US, uh, as soon as COVID hit, they began, in a second, museums began to cut their stuff and furlough people, in a second. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, while, while in Italy, uh, it was about cutting budgets. 
So, I mean, you know, uh, what is the best? What is the worst? Uh, the best would be an in-between, you know, in, in which you could, you know, at the same time save, uh, you know, the stuff and, and the budget. Uh, the interesting thing is that while in the U.S. they were cutting budgets and so there was, you know, there was a lot of fear, you know, especially for the more fragile, you know, elements of the staff, those who are, you know, uh, working on a, you know, on a contract uh, on, a, on a limited amount of time and, and, and so on. So, so museums, I would say, didn't have that much of a time, I mean, museum professionals, I mean, to think about, uh, you know, uh, the, the the radical change, uh, the cultural change, the you know the the this huge transition was implying. It was more about you know surviving and fighting, you know, to have contracts back and not to be to be left at home and and so on. So um, in in Europe there was more time, you know, to to think about things. And so for instance, I'm I'm reflecting on what the Triennale did. You know, they did a lot of uh, uh, online. Uh, you know, webinars uh, talking about the, this change. So they had time to think about the change more than, you know, the urge about uh, <laughs> this, this, this thing that they had to cut their stuff. Well, maybe this could be an opportunity to find that uh, balance, to find that third way in between the two, because uh, that definitely yeah, it's hopefully. needed. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, like in Europe, we definitely need more private engagement to museum, you know, more uh, endowments and private funding, you know, uh, for sure. Um, last thing I want to ask you is specifically about Italian art. Uh, and if you think that this situation we're experiencing uh, also from a financial point of view, the, the financial difficulties, is going to or is already affecting particularly uh, the uh, ability to promote uh, or show Italian art throughout the world and if you know Italy is going to specifically suffer more from um, what, what we're experiencing right now uh, and maybe here we want to start with Laura. Uh, well uh, the great risk for Italian art is just to be Italian art, is a provincial art. Not art in general, but art of a country as Egyptian art, uh, Azerbaijan art, or uh, I don't know, something as that. No. Um, I think that uh, for contemporary artists, uh, this is a very challenging moment. And uh, I think the, the, the public could do a lot, but unfortunately, there is also a lot of nepotism or politics uh, and uh, in the way uh, the things are uh, run in Italy, mostly for contemporary art, it was always in this way. Um, if I can ask uh, something also to Marina, that is uh, in person responsible for uh, public art in Milan, uh, is uh, uh, that from this experience where the death affect, uh, of people loved affect so many of us, so many Italians, to put attention in the place where the body of the dead people are left. Uh, our uh, room for uh, in the hospital or also in the public space uh, where the, the dead are left and there is the last possibility to tell goodbye to the people that you love uh, are not uh, are, are, don't have any dignity they are terrible they are sad they are uh, cold they are old and i think to use art to give more dignity to this place after these terrible expenses of the pandemic uh, could be something positive Laura, that's a beautiful idea, and um, it reminds me of Ettore Spalletti. 
Liberté yes, in uh, at uh, oh. Hôpital Poincaré in, in Paris. I, I did a travel on purpose to visit that artwork. Uh, he did this uh, Salle de Départ, which was about those uh, uh, corpse of people who were left behind and nobody knew, you know, if they had a, a religion or whatever. Uh, so it was like a transitional space, uh, which he designed with no specific signs of any religion. And it was so beautiful. And I agree with you. I, I will take this into consideration. All, all our uh, hospital need desperately. Death. Yeah, I, I, I will take this into consideration. It's a great Thank advice. Um, Marina, do you want, do you have any insight, any thoughts about um, how this is affecting specifically Italian art? Well, as, as Laura said, Italian art already suffers of, of, of its uh, own provinciality, or at least the way it is, it is, it is read, you know, abroad as a provincial art. Uh, but I have to say that the Italian government is trying, you know, to do pretty well, at least, you know, they, they have uh, um, started some grants like the Italian Council and lately this uh, uh, pack, uh, which are aimed at, uh, pro you know, promoting the production of uh, contemporary arts and also uh, to make this uh, contemporary uh, artworks uh, travel around, uh, you know, internationally to be, to be more, you know, um, to, to be more uh, uh, available to, to different, uh, you know, curators and, uh, and nations. Uh, so, uh, I mean, for sure, it's a situation which has affected any anyone on a global level, and obviously, the weakest uh, are are going to suffer more. Mm. It's in general, of course. Of course. Um, we have a question from the audience. This is actually from someone you know, Laura, <laughs> Ilaria Barzaghi. Ah, yes. um, yeah, the former fellow. Yeah, she, is, she follows all the episodes. Thank you, Ilaria, <laughs> for the question and for following us. Um, so she's asking uh, to both of you if there is anything um, the U.S. government is doing, um, if the U.S. government is doing something uh, to help culture institutions which are uh, run by private owners, and if it is doing something, uh, what it's doing. If you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I personally don't know. Um, specifically, uh, that, that the current administration with Trump is not in favor of the culture in general and uh, of the art uh, specifically. Um, there is a difference that was I was speaking about before between the private uh, foundation and the public foundation. The private foundation in the end of the families in general, uh, wealthy families, and it is completely their responsibility to run this, uh, this foundation. For the public charity instead, uh, there is, uh, the, the public charity need to be um, with the money from uh, more than, more people, more than 20 people for example, and uh, they are ruled very strict and um, all the, what you give to this uh, um, foundation is completely deductible, not only in part as in Italy, but uh, uh, this foundation, of course, are the most suffering and uh, I wish that with the new administration, uh, more attention will be on, on these institutions. Yeah, definitely the Trump administration has not been um, very uh, attentive to the art world. Uh, they, they also wanted to defund the National Endowment for the Arts. Yeah. So, um, Marina, do you know I, anything I, I, else on this I, topic? I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't know how to answer that. Okay. All right. Um, I think we might be out of time. Yes, we are. So... Um, I just wanted to tell to our audience what you're uh, working on maybe uh, for the next uh, few months, what, where they can see your work in the next few months. Um, uh, Marina, you want to start? Oh, there is another question. Wait a second. Oh, no. It's a thank you from Ilaria. <laughs> Actually, I can read a, a question from Fiamma Montezemolo. It's about the role of public... Oh, I didn't see it. Where is it? In the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, it's in the chat and not in the Q&A. Okay, so please go ahead, read it. 
how the role of public and site specific art will change grow after COVID. Are the changes more online and public components present now for COVID reasons, possibly more permanent changes? Um, I'm not sure about this for, for I mean, for, for sure, public art and everything which is outdoors uh, is, is going to be more, you know, at the center of things uh, than indoor activities. Um, about the role of public and the relationship with the artworks, you know, it, it's going to be interesting because I, I believe this, all this, you know, distance, all this physical and social distancing we have been uh, practicing in in months it's something we will uh, we will go back from with a lot of difficulty I, I believe now we have like each of us has very set in mind that there's a, a tiny amount of people you can you know like interact uh, physically and so and so I believe this will have an impact in general you know in, in I mean, it has already had, but it's going to be a long-term, you know, change in the relationship we will have with space and with the artwork. So, I mean, I'm curious, I'm not sure about that, but I, I believe the perception and, and the relationship with the artwork in general is going, is going to, to change. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Fiamma, for the question. <laughs> uh, Laura? I am sorry for my phone that is ringing. Oh, okay, no, no problem. Did, did you want to say anything about the question from Fiamma? Okay, so uh, I guess we're getting to the end. And ag again, um, if you want to talk uh, a little bit on what you're going to be working on in the next few months so that people can see uh, your work, maybe. Um, okay. So I am um, I am I am teaching. Um, I am working for the city of Milan as head of public art, and we have many, many, too many to mention uh, different uh, projects. And on a personal level, as an art historian, I'm working on a big exhibition about environments, uh, which is going to be held in two years in a German museum. So I cannot say more than this. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And Laura mentioned uh, uh, Chima will uh, reopen hopefully uh, with the, this show of uh, Mario Schifano in New York uh, from uh, 1960 to 365. The show will run uh, all the year probably because we don't know how many people we can have at time, uh, every time, uh, perhaps uh, just a few people. And for this reason, we ex probably we will extend till the fall. We are not uh, completely sure, but this is uh, the problem. And I am working for a new show uh, for the 22, that will be about uh, uh, the art with the social content. Uh, during the last uh, uh, decades of the uh, 19th century and the beginning of 20th century. This just met with the important instance of uh, uh, social, social justice uh, that come from this country. I can't wait to see that show. Thank you. Um, so as for us, we're going to be back on December 3rd. Uh, I bring to you the uh, goodbye uh, of Paolo Barlera as well, uh, who uh, has been having problems with his video. So um, he asked me to say goodbye to you. And uh, thank you very much for being here, Marina and Laura. And thank you to our audience. Um, see you on December 3rd for the last episode. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.